This is All India Radio. In the program Spotlight, now we bring you a discussion on H3N2 virus infection, preventive measures and treatment. The participants are Dr. Raman Ganga Khedkar, former head, Division of Epidemiology and Communicable Diseases, Indian Council of Medical Research, ICMR, and Rajesh Lake, AIR correspondent. Dr. Ganga Khedkar, would you tell us what is H3N2V? When the season starts changing towards summer season, you generally by and large start getting cough and cold. Most often, we used to call it as flu. Flu is a short form of influenza. Now, when you talk of influenza, there are two different types of influenza viruses which can infect us. One is called as influenza type A, influenza type B. But influenza type A consists of two different viruses. One is H1N1, which caused a pandemic in 2009. And the other virus is H3N2. These numbers are given based on their certain protein structures in which we should not go. But there are two organisms in influenza A, which are important from people's perspective or the health perspective, that is H1N1 and H3N2. This time, H3N2 is a common viral infection that is being observed globally. Is it close to corona? No, no, not at all. These are two unrelated viruses, completely different viruses. It is just that we are becoming more aware of regarding viruses because of our past experience with COVID. And the result is people tend to worry whether this is a related event, whether this could be COVID or could this be influenza and things like that. So every symptom is being taken seriously. But the reality is these two are unrelated viruses. H1N1 pandemic was caused in 2009. If you look at H3N2, every year the organism changes. The organism that is going to infect different people changes every year. This is something which is very common. H3N2 may come, uh, let's say, once in two, three years or whatever. It all depends on the virus per se. But they are unrelated to COVID. COVID virus did not cause any infection prior to 2020 no, among human beings. So what are the symptoms of H3N2? H3N2 has similar symptoms as you see in influenza. What are the common symptoms in influenza? The common symptoms essentially are non-specific. If you think in terms of symptoms, the symptoms will be mild flu-like illness, which would be something like uh, fever, cough, sore throat. There would be running nose. People will say they feel uh, that the muscles are aching. Some people may have diarrhea. Some people may have vomiting. But these are very non-specific symptoms that tend to occur. So based on symptom, you cannot say whether this could be H3N2. I heard you say that this is a very common kind of a cold that generally people have. So why is it uh, taking a direction where people are kind of concerned about it? They say it is dangerous. One issue which we must remember is though this infection otherwise is mild, among people who are older, who are above, let's say as my age will grow beyond 65, the risk of severe disease with these influenza viruses tends to increase. It may cause breathlessness and pneumonia, and a small proportion of them are likely to succumb to this particular infection, as we saw in COVID uh, per se. And similar is the situation when it comes to very young ages, like less than two years of age. If it is less than six months of age of the child, then the risk continues to be extremely high at that point in time. And pregnant women are also likely to have severe disease as a manifestation. And therefore, people tend to worry about it. And mainly because this is a vaccine preventable illness. No? If these people, those who are very old and those who are pregnant during this particular season, if they, if they want to prevent this infection, they may as well take an influenza vaccine, which covers currently for 2023 the vaccine that is available. It covers against H1N1 and also H3N2. Both the viruses are covered. This is likely to protect them for almost one year's time. It takes about two weeks' time to develop antibodies against it. This vaccine is similar to what we saw in Covaxin, 
you know, this, this is a whole inactivated virus that is used in this particular vaccine. So that's the reason why we are talking more about it, because people perhaps now understand the importance of prevention, especially among old age population, of all these diseases that can perhaps easily prevent it. And what is also important is we have learned certain etiquette which are associated with COVID-appropriate behavior. And this is a point when we can actually emphasize that continuing these behaviors, at least by those who are symptomatic, is going to remain vital. And that's something which will help us in the long run. Very well said. So, Dr. Ganga Khedkar, influenza viruses are usually considered to be self-limiting and benign. But this year, as you pointed out, uh, patients are suffering from the infection, are reporting prolonged cough, persistent fever and uh, other complications. And if I'm not mistaken, in some cases, hospitalization is also taken up or in fact has gone up, necessitating increased vigilance. So what is it that a person needs to do to safeguard himself or herself? The first thing which I would say is there is still insufficient evidence to say that this year H3N2 has increased severity per se. It had earlier come in 2018, the same H3N2 virus, because this virus has different strains, and every year the strains tend to be different for influenza. The vaccine tends to cover against whichever strain that is expected to come into the population based on certain mathematical algorithms. Now, the other thing that we have to understand, if suppose I have heard that in my area, H3N2 has been reported, because you cannot distinguish it merely from clinical signs and symptoms, you need to do RT-PCR test and find out whether this is H3N2, H1N1 or influenza type, type A, that can also be done like the way we used to do in COVID with rapid antigen testing, but it may not tell you whether this is H3N2 or H1N1. Now, given that, what becomes more important is those who are older, they suffer from such symptoms. Those who are pregnant women and suffer from similar symptoms should approach to a doctor since H3N2 is circulating as of now. They could actually try and take treatment because there are two different drugs. One is called as Oseltamivir and the other is Zanamvir. Both these drugs can be prescribed by the doctor to an individual if they approach him within 48 hours of development of symptoms. And then these drugs have to be taken. If the person comes out as positive, then we give these drugs twice a day for five days. If the person is only exposed to somebody who had the documented H3N2 infection, then in those cases we give one tablet for 10 days to prevent this infection among those who are high-risk cases. So essentially, do I need to do something different for everybody? I don't think so. You will have to do the same for those who are older, the most vulnerable or high-risk population of pregnant women. In those cases, we should approach the doctor. Otherwise, more often than not, this will go away on its own as a self-limiting illness. Also, people with acute respiratory illness, SARI yeah. and influenza-like illness, ILI, they've been found to be suffering from H3N2. You did mention the medicines, the treatment towards it, but if you could elaborate on uh, what should a person be doing to safeguard, of course, things like, you know, drinking enough water, keeping social distancing, if you could elaborate the other means. We need to remember that COVID has taught us very important lessons, that if you want to prevent the spread of respiratory viruses, one thing which we must understand is people could wear masks. Now, we also know we have a COVID fatigue that has crept in. People don't want to use masks. But at least those who are symptomatic, let's say I have fever, cough and cold, sore throat, or I feel that my muscles are aching. In those circumstances, what I should do is at least I should wear a mask so that I don't transmit it to somebody else in my family, those who come in my contact per se. That's a very simple thing to do. Second thing which I must also remember is I should try and ensure that uh, whenever I have cough or I sneeze, you know, like we taught in COVID, you know, I should use my upper shirt sleeve 
to cough or sneeze so that it, the others may not get infected and you shouldn't do it on your hands because if you do it you are going to touch different surfaces and then infection could be transmitted to other people per se because this is a classical droplet infection that we need to remember now if you are eating together please don't share the food in the same plate where you are in which you are eating because you know sharing of cups eating utensils can actually lead to the risk of transmission to others what is also important is you should wash your hands often the same way as we used to talk about uh, in covid and if you maintain this hand hygiene the risk would be far lesser and what is most important is more often than not you find that if a child is sick there is a tendency among us that the child is sent to the school despite the fact that the child has symptom now just imagine that the child has h3n2 now in those circumstances what will happen the child will spread this infection to other school children and these school children since they are infected they will spread the infection in their own households per se so if you have to break the chain of transmission what is most important is if the child is sick please do not send the child to the school use of mask at least by those who have symptoms and ensuring that we isolate ourselves maintain social distance is perhaps something which will remain as protective behavior so it has an infectious trait in it absolutely okay. this is an infection no so what about uh, how grave is the situation because the government of india is working with states and extending support for public health measures to address the situation so would you please keep the mind of our listeners at ease and at rest about uh, how grave is the situation or is it something we do not need to be worried about there are two things <laughs> since i come from scientific background no none of us know the magnitude of this infection because you know more often than not you will find not everybody who has these symptoms will approach and get themselves tested so we cannot talk about burden of disease so if i don't know the magnitude i can't say based on magnitude that the infection that is occurring is very large in terms of numbers that perhaps is we don't have that evidence but does that mean that everybody should be worried when we hear about one death or two deaths that have occurred in karnataka i would not think so okay. but does this mean that this infection should be taken as a benign kind of infection it can certainly be something which is important for those who are older as i said those who are pregnant women and those who are children younger than 2 years of age i think there we need to take it very seriously we should avoid uh, taking it casually in these uh, populations per se but for rest of them does this mean that the entire population has to be worried about the spread of these infections i would don't think we still have any evidence to suggest that. doctor um, icmr has said that uh, as the temperatures begin to rise this uh, virus will go down how much yes, of truth because you know <laughs> viruses also require certain environmental conditions to thrive as the temperature goes up the humidity component it changes in such a manner that for the viruses which are spread through droplets they cannot thrive in that environment and don't cause infection so perhaps this wave difficult to speculate because the weather change or the climate change that is occurring you can't really predict when the summer will set in but you should not expect to my mind that this particular outbreak will last beyond 2 to 3 weeks from now on that positive note uh, big thank you to dr ganga gaidkar thank you you were listening to a discussion on h3n2 virus infection preventive measures and treatment the participants were Dr Raman Ganga Khedkar former head division of epidemiology and communicable diseases Indian Council of Medical Research ICMR and Rajesh Lake AIR correspondent this program was produced and presented by the news services division of All India Radio you can listen to it on our mobile app news on air the program is also available on our youtube channel news on air official you may email your opinion about this program at airnsttalks@gmail.com